The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Jenny Jablonski, retired from a career in private security in 2001 to focus on unresolved medical issues. And over the years, traditional medical treatments had not been effective, and the prescription medication she was taking finally caused her heart to stop beating, triggering a near-death experience in the early morning hours of her 47th birthday. This very interesting story has been recounted in the past two shows. This is actually... Uh, Jenny's third appearance um, in a row on NDE Radio, and this week we're going to talk about how she came to communicate with animals. So, Jenny, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. I'm so excited to be back. Well, I, I am too, because I think this is going to be uh, uh, the maybe perhaps the most interesting show, because I know you have some very interesting stories about animal communications. How did uh, you begin communicating with the animals? Well, following my NDE, as I shared before, uh, the opening to the other side was <clears throat> uh, quite vast. There was a lot of information flowing through, and I was communicating with uh, discarnate beings, with people who had crossed over, with animals, with trees, and I had never heard of anything like that. And in the interest of time, I will just say that my focus was very much living, getting myself off of opioids and going on a healing journey, which, as many near-death experiencers can attest, is is quite personal and profound and involves a lot of seeking and a lot of spiritual education. When I was doing this, all of these different activities, I forgot about my experiences with the animals prior to my NDE. Remember, my horse was now in a sanctuary, so we only had a dog in the house. And I did not remember until I had hypnotic regression, the events of my NDE that included animals. So, oh. As I continued on my healing journey and people continued to insist that I was a healer and I needed to provide tools to people and help people with information that I was bringing through, I really resisted it for quite a, a long period of time. I have to be honest, I felt like a bit of a fraud. Here I was with these people who had studied for 20 or 30 years or 40 years or you know, had meditated every day for 35 years. I mean, mm. really remarkable people who were quite learned, quite experienced, had a tremendous amount of education. And I was starting from zero with basically very high volume and vi high level of information channeling through me. And, and having previously, you know, majored in economics and been an accountant and, and then carried a gun for a living, I was a little practical and a, a little more logical thinking. And I really needed to understand how things happened. Mm -hmm. And so I went on a journey myself to heal myself. And I knew better than to start trying to call myself a healer. But eventually, I was pretty much strong armed into helping people. It, the healers that I was going to for help were asking me for help. And it became just undeniable that I was able to provide information and that I somehow either spontaneously knew or spontaneously channeled the absolute perfect thing for people to hear what they needed to hear, the, the doors that needed to be opened in their consciousness, the the blocks that they had, I began to realize that I could perceive stuck energy in people's nervous system and belief systems that were quite limiting and, and quite negative and creating patterns in people's lives. And it was as if I was gifted these incredible gifts, but with no instruction manual, none whatsoever. Mm. And as I did slowly begin to help people, 
I pretty much over six or nine months had clients all across the world, Ecuador, Panama, uh, Switzerland, Belgium, Mexico, Canada, Hawaii, uh, you know, all over the place. And what happened was as I was talking with people, their animals would begin to come through past or present. And I didn't think that much of it. I would just say, oh, I, I see a white kitten in your energy field. Do you own a white kitten? And, you know, a person might say, well, when I was younger, I had a kitten that passed away or ran away and we never found out what happened to him. Or one time I was talking with a woman and it was purely a human session. And I said, do you have a horse? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, well, there's this chestnut gelding with a white blaze and he wants to talk to you. Is this your horse? (laughs) And and, you know, I mean, that was a very interesting call in itself because the horse was quite upset with the woman. It turned out the woman was quite upset with the horse and the horse really was coming forward to to set the woman straight about some things. And it always seemed like that with me. It seemed as if the the resolution that was able to unfold on these calls, the the high level of information, the misunderstanding that was cleared up, the healing that was facilitated between human and animal was profound and undeniable. And so one day I began in my own meditation to sort of ask spirit, what is going on with all of these animals intruding? <laughs> and I think mm-hmm. I use that word, you know, intruding mm-hmm. on my sessions with my clients. And I was face to face in vision with a herd of horses and donkeys and dogs and cats, I mean, just like a menagerie of animals, wild animals. And they were right in my face. And they said, don't you remember you're supposed to help us? And I didn't. I didn't remember, but I began to meditate on it and I went to psychics and, you know, mediums and I had Akashic Records readers look into it and and I attempted hypnotic regression to try to figure it out. And I then was projected back into the near-death experience where the animals were there and called me back. So that's how it really started for me. Wow. So that... uh... Well, the description that you gave in the last show about uh, the, how the horses drew you away from Jesus and back into this world is really a, an amazing story. But you had forgotten that uh, for a while. Yes, I did. All I remembered in the morning when I woke up was that if I didn't get off the opioids, I was going to die. Mm. And as you know, and again, it's not this program, um, I have been on just a national tour speaking out against opioids and the overprescription of opioids. And, and my journey really focused on getting off of the opioids and coming to understand what alternative healing even meant, alternative medicine, uh, functional medicine, integrative medicine. I never knew anything any of that existed, even though my husband and I were well-educated people. Yes. Well, now that you're back, what made you decide, or maybe you haven't decided to um, concentrate primarily on uh, animal communication? It sounds like the link between the owner and the animal uh, is a very important aspect of the, their their problem as well. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because there's a fun story, and I will try to make it brief. Yes, I realized then that I was supposed to help the animals, but I didn't have any clue as to what extent, nor did I understand that I specialized in trauma or had the ability, the capacity to overcome my own trauma, to be able to share those tools with others. And one morning in, um, goodness, I think it was 2017, it was about one o'clock in the morning, I was woken from a dead sleep and I was told, go to San Diego. And I'm like, what the heck? Why would I go to San Diego? I don't know anybody in San Diego. You know, I have one friend there. And I went back to sleep and I was woken again. Go to San Diego. I couldn't figure out why, but I couldn't go back to sleep. So I got on my phone on Facebook. Sure enough, there was a fire in San Diego County and there were 900 horses displaced from the fire. Mm. And I 
jumped up and I threw some clothes in a suitcase um, enough for a week or so. And I started driving to San Diego and I called the only friend I knew there. And, you know, I assumed I'd have to stay in a hotel. But sure enough, my friend had just bought a condominium. It was empty. And they said the electricity and water is running. If you want to sleep on the floor, go for it. And I did. I drove to San Diego into an empty condo <laughs> and and I went to the Del Mar Fairgrounds, which is where they were housing in excess of 900 animals. And again, this is a beautiful long story, some of which I documented on my blog. Um, and, I, and for the sake of time, you know, I really want to uh, make this very concise. But basically, I began working with traumatized animals there because of the fire. And there were horses that had been sedated or needed sedated. And when I when I worked with them, they would completely calm down. And after I left about an hour and a half later, they would go back to swaying or weaving or trying to jump out of, you know, the four foot high doors of the stalls there. And um I I met a lot of people and I got a lot of phone calls from people who were telling people about me. And I began, uh, I stayed there about 10 days or 11 days. And I, I went to a number of people's homes and just worked with traumatized animal after traumatized animal after traumatized animal. And there was tremendous results from it. Now, what happened, though, is in that experience, I met a horse named Claire that I absolutely fell in love with. It was an amazing horse, very good at human communication, you know, an animal communication situation. The horse was brilliant, was funny, was it, 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 it when I walked toward the horse's stall, I literally threw my hands in the air spontaneously and exclaimed, I love life. I love all people. And I, I looked around and I said to the woman that was guiding me to the stall, is that the horse I'm going to talk to? Because that's the horse that just channeled through me. And she said, yes. Well, long story short, that horse belonged to a sanctuary. I tried to adopt the horse, but there was a tragic accident while loading the horse and taking it back to the sanctuary where the horse fell over backwards, broke it back and eventually died. Oh dear. And in memory of that horse, I dedicated a year of my life. I said, well, I seem to be good at this. I seem to have call. I'm going to take a year out of my life and I'm going to volunteer all across the country at sanctuaries in Claire's name. And I spent over $50,000 that next year, which was about the entire year of 2018. And I traveled all across the U.S. I called up different sanctuaries or was recommended through friends to different sanctuaries. And I went and I volunteered in Claire's name for traumatized animals. And it it was a, a snowball rolling downhill. It just gained momentum and size. And it just undeniable. This is my calling. This is what I'm good at. Mm. How clear are animals on on the um, causes of their uh discontent of their upsetness and do they understand i mean do they give you a history and do they attribute the say bad treatment or or some some horrendous you know ptsd type accident to to why they're feeling the way they are some do Every horse is different, just like people and personalities and life experience. It's the same. My experience is that animals have unique experiences, life experiences, traumatic experiences, good owners, bad owners, good breeders, bad breeders, good trainers, bad trainers, um, abandonment issues, trauma issues. And it's different for every horse. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes the horses will talk about that they've taken on the belief systems of prior owners so they can't possibly have a certain conversation. I had a donkey once tell me he was a Frisian in a past life who was told that Frisians were the strongest, most beautiful, most intelligent horses on the planet. So that's why he was so mean to all the horses at the sanctuary was where he was because he only liked Frisian horses. And he literally <laughs> said, I know this isn't true, but this is in my mind. And can you help me get it out of my mind? I mean, this is the level of awareness the, uh, that animals actually have that they share with me because my paradigm doesn't limit me from hearing these types of things. So they can bring, in some cases at least, they can bring clear memories of past lives uh, with them to explain their, their behavior? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, not all horses. Not all horses. Some don't believe in it because their, their owners don't believe in it. 
But what I have is, in addition to the ability to communicate with the soul of the animal, I also have an incredible connection to what some people might call the causal plane, what some people might call the unified field. And depending on your philosophy or ideology, you might call it different things. I have a tremendous access to information if the animal doesn't want to provide it to me, but the soul does want me to be aware of it. And so, and again, it's different for every animal, but I might see visions, I might feel emotions, I might experience color, I might um, hear a human being talking to them or saying specific things. And honestly, it's different for every animal. There are a lot of people out there who want to to paint the consciousness of animals with a singular brush, and it's impossible. It would be like trying to paint humans with a singular brush, and you've met thousands of and talked to and interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people, Lee, and you know that not one of us is the same. It's true. Do some of your animals report having been humans in their past lives? Yes, absolutely. And can they tell you details of what they what they did or who they were? Yes. In fact, um, I find a lot of soul entanglement with owner and horse, especially in medieval times. There were some rituals that weren't, uh, you know, very loving or kind where in battle, um, if the the leader of the army was um, taken down, they might. Uh, then murder the horse, disembowel the horse, do some sort of a ceremony, you know, remove. I mean, I'm sorry, this is very dark and yucky. I apologize. But it, it, it created an entanglement of souls. And there were also times where animals and people don't understand that um, certain people chose certain experiences and we feel very responsible or karmically tied. I, I mean, the list goes on and on. There, there's just not enough time in these short shows to really be fair and to cover um, the, the breadth of the experience that can be brought forward by animals. Do you have a couple of favorite stories you'd like to tell about uh, about animal encounters? I do. I do. Um, I think I'll start with the horse that lied to me. Okay. Um, I was in Maryland at a horse sanctuary, and I, w- I was there for two days. I usually spend at least two days, and it was toward the end of the first day, and had worked with many animals and although not a lot of uh horses had came with a lot of information the information i was giving matched their personality or matched their trauma or matched their um injury what have you so i was being fairly validated although it's oftentimes difficult to completely validate in such situations and we got to one and and remember now, I don't ask any information about the animal, so I don't know any history. And um, in particular, there was one woman who was very concerned about one particular horse. And the horse told me, oh, I had a perfect life. I lived with this little old lady, and she used to sit on her back porch, and it had flowers all around, you know, and it was this. <clears throat> and and they didn't really say anything. I just gave the information that the animal had, and and we went on. And they were very kind and and loving. And we went on to the next horse. And the vision I got was exactly perfect because the vision I got was, you know, a parade and a lot of people around. And they had just taken the horse to a a large fair where the the horse had that experience. So I kept being validated and validated. So there was no reason for me to think that this information from this horse was incorrect and nobody gave any incorrect in indication. Mm-hmm. I went to my hotel and I'm sleeping in the middle of the night and the horse comes barreling into my energy field and s- wakes me up and says, I have been compelled to tell you that I have lied to you. And it doesn't really bother me. But all the other horses are very upset that by my lying to you, it could somehow um, affect your reputation. And so I have been forced to come forward and tell you that I have lied. And I said, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the people at the sanctuary will believe me unless I give them something substantial, something verifiable. What can you tell me? Please, will you tell me your history? And 
And Lee, this is a clear example of a horse who was so traumatized, they refused to tell you the truth. But this is the first time I've ever had somebody give me a cover story. Usually it's, you know, you get nothing or or they ask to talk about something else. Mm -hmm. So I said to the horse, please give me something verifiable. And the horse said to me, all I can tell you is that I want to live here forever. So I went back to the sanctuary the next morning and I immediately went to the public relations director of the sanctuary and I said, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but this particular horse came and said that it had lied. And she goes, oh, yeah, I wasn't we, I wasn't really vibing with with what you were saying. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, you know, why didn't you tell me? And she said, well, I didn't I wasn't really sure it mattered. And I said, well. I asked the horse, please, to tell me something that would be verifiable. And all the horse would say to me is that it wanted to live here forever. And she goes, oh, yeah, you were absolutely talking to the horse. And I said, well, how do you know that? And she said, because I tell that horse every day it will live here forever. It will never leave. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. So I have a few more really fun stories. Oh, well, go for it. So I had a, a, now this was not a technical client. This was my niece, my niece who really doesn't believe in animal communication at all, but we were at a family luncheon and you know, if there's an animal communicator around and you figure it's your only hope, you're like, well, if this BS is real, I'll go ahead and ask and see if she can help, you know? (laughs) So I promise you, my family did did not believe in what I was selling. Right. But so they had a, um, a bull terrier and when my niece would travel, she would leave um, the dog with my sister-in-law who had three or four cats in the house and the bull terrier hated cats. And well, they didn't tell me they didn't tell me what was happening. All I knew is that they wanted me to talk to the dog and there was a problem with the dog. So I, I, I speak to the dog and the dog immediately tells me I hate, 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 hate cats. And they're like, yes, exactly. You know, and, and I go, well, why does it do you have a cat? And she goes, no. But when the dog stays with my mom, he attacks her cats. And so I say to the dog, well, you seem to be a very intelligent dog. And, you know, your owner, who is my niece, whom I love very much, loves you very much. And what can we do to bring some peace to the household? Because your only option for care on the weekends is apparently, you know, my stepsister. And she really loves you. And we really would prefer if you wouldn't attack the cats. And he said, OK, I'll stop attacking the cats. So she sends me an email a few weeks later, and and she says, oh, my gosh, he's been to my mom's house twice. He hasn't bothered the cats once. It's incredible. Oh, my gosh. The only problem is now the cats are attacking him. And I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, let me know how that shakes out, you know. And so my sis- stepsister called me up and said, will you talk to my cats? And I'm like, yeah, no, the cats are very angry that he had, uh, was allowed to attack them for so long. They're not going to stop attacking him. So. I get a phone call a couple of weeks later and my niece says, now when the tax, the cats attack him, he goes over and pees in their litter box. So he never went back to attacking the cats, but he retaliated by peeing in the cat's litter box. Ah, and did that stop the cat's bad behavior? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, no, I mean, look, sometimes even a really incredible animal communicator can't solve every problem. <laughs> No, I guess not. <laughs> I um, think we have time for at least one more story. Okay. Um, I spoke with a, a client on the phone, and I had I had no idea of who she was, et cetera. And um, she wanted me to speak to a, a, a dog, a chihuahua. And he came forward right away, and he said, what's the matter with daddy? And I said, who does he consider daddy? What's the matter with daddy? Well, apparently the woman was married and her husband was in end stage renal failure. Mm. And she said um, she explained that he has kidney disease, you know, and um, she asked the dog, please, would you mind? You know, you love being on daddy's lap. You love jumping on daddy. But would you kindly not do it because it causes him great pain? And the dog said, yes, of course, I'll never do that again. And then the dog's next question was, What do I need to do to stay here? Because in my last house, and apparently he was a rescue, in my last house, my owner died and I went to the pound. And he said, I don't want to leave. What do I need to do to stay? I like it here. And the woman assured the dog, the dog would never go anywhere else, um, even if the, you know, the husband passed, that he would stay. And um, 
and the dog was had said to me, okay, I'm done. Thank you for the information. And the woman relayed to me that when I started talking with the dog, the dog came up, sat right next to her on the couch, stared her straight in the eyes the whole time we were talking. And as soon as the dog said it was done and didn't have anything further to say, and, and I said that out loud, the dog jumped down and went back to his little dog bed. Mm. And she was apparently uh, another one who would said that she never believed in animal communication before and that she was just floored by by what we had experienced. Wow. Now, there are some dogs who've been trained to detect diseases. And uh, I wonder, have you ever encountered a dog that knew the owner had a cancer that they could smell or what, however it is they detect disease, but didn't know how to tell the owner that they were sick? Yes, um, there is a lot of that. I've had dogs that can see dead people and they're trying to tell the people that, you know, Aunt Betty is here, but the dog doesn't know how. And many people call me because the dogs won't go into a certain room or randomly the dog will start barking at the ceiling for no reason. And when I explain what it is and then I talk to the deceased person who's coming forward and give them the message they never come back and the dog doesn't bark randomly again. Um, dogs can detect frequency. Dogs, some dogs have tr- di- different gifts and abilities, just like people, just like we manifest different gifts and abilities. So do animals manifest different gifts and abilities. It's incredible. I have met some therapy dogs and in, in particular horses who absolutely do not want the job they have because they have already been traumatized or it's just not their life path. And in some cases, it's rather abusive for some of these animals to be in the situation, but the people just don't know and understand. Right, right. And another question that has often crossed my mind, when a, when a pet dies, does its spirit uh, hang around the house? Uh, do, does it stay with the owner for a while? And if the owner gets a new pet, uh, can the new pet uh, acknowledge or or communicate with the old the old pet? Um, yes, on both. But the first one is yes and. So yes, oftentimes the animal can stay with the person. Um, sometimes they can come and go, uh, or they do come and go. Um, there is a theory that uh, you cannot talk to a deceased pet for three days because they need three days on the other side. That is not at all my experience. My experience is that they, they talk to me right through the euthanasia and beyond and after. And sometimes they'll say, I'm going to do my healing and I'll be back. And sometimes I've actually had an animal that says I can do my healing and be here at the same time. It's, you know, we're infinite beings. So there's a lot of belief systems that I think get in the way of, of people um, feeling uh, grace, you know, feeling an easing of their grief and knowing that the animals are around. Um, and I apologize. Could the, the second question you asked was really good. May I? <clears throat> yes. The, um, the new pet. Can the new pet uh, see the the spirit of the old pet or know that it's there? Uh, yes, oftentimes that can be the case. I get phone calls because there are concerns. Um, there are pets who grieve the, the passing of an animal companion. There are pets who reincarnate and tell the person, okay, I'm going to come back as a as a white puppy or, you know, I'm going to come back as a as a, a mare that you're going to rescue in the future. Um, it's it's just phenomenal. So the old pets, the spirit of the old pets, will try to reincarnate in a way that ke- keeps them connected with their family? Dependent upon soul agreement, yes. Mm. Especially if someone is a healer or an animal communicator or you know, a massage therapist or a a, a therapist, a marriage and family counselor or someone where they enjoy having pets around in the office and that type of thing. And it it is, I think, largely dependent on soul history together and soul agreements. You're probably familiar with the Rainbow Bridge that's very popular with people who who lose their, their pets. 
Uh, do you see any truth in that? Do you see a, a connection uh, in the on the other side between our souls and our pets? I do. Um, unfortunately, I've read a, a few books with different theories um, as to how that works. Some people believe they are um, like sacred geometrical form. Um, some people believe there's very much a heaven. I have perceived a couple of different ways. Uh, I've been able to go through the Akashic records into like a waiting or visiting room and, you know, call the animal forward. I've been projected into a beautiful space where the souls of animals by breed gather together. But then there's also a space where sort of, you know, the Heinz 57 dog um, or the the rescue menagerie come together as well. Um, I don't think there's really any one way. And just as people say that dependent upon our belief systems, that is the experience we have when we cross over or experience our NDE, it's similar for animals as well. Ginny, I'm afraid we're out of time once again. Um, and I want to thank you so much. This is the third show you've done, and I would urge our listeners to go back uh, into our past shows and listen to the first two as well as this one. Um, th this has been very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you, Ginny Jablonski, um, for sharing your story. And um, if the listeners would like to uh, hear this one again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org. For information on IANS, check out their website at iands.org. And join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.